Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Susanna Lovejoy with Everbridge, and today's topic is Understanding the Security Challenges for Business Operations in Mexico. Our format will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session. At the right side of your screen, you'll see a box for questions, and I encourage you to type in a question at any time. My colleague, Jose Salazar, Everbridge's Global Insights Manager, will be joining us for that portion. I'd like to turn it over to our main presenter for today, Zachary Nelson, our Regional Analyst for Latin America and the Caribbean. Take it away, Zach. Hi, thank you so much, Susanna. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Zachary Nelson, and uh, I'm the Global Insights Team's Regional Analyst for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I've been closely following and reporting on Mexico in this capacity for just about the last four years. And today I'd like to discuss uh, the biggest security concerns for businesses operating in Mexico. So uh, to begin, I'd like to start with just kind of a big picture overview to establish some context and consider some of the different dynamics that we see in different parts of the country. And then the three primary topics I'm going to cover are extortion, cargo theft, and disruptive protest activity. So everybody's heard of Mexico's war on drugs, but um, perhaps it might better be called a war on organized crime because while narcotics trafficking and the vast amount of wealth it generates still uh, continues to play the central role in the conflict, many of the large cartels have begun to expand beyond drugs in recent years in order to pursue other illicit enterprises and diversify their streams of income. In some cases, we've seen crimes such as uh, fuel theft give rise to violent new turf wars that uh, are really akin to those that we've historically seen surrounding the drug trade. And it's important to recognize that when it comes to security in Mexico, the country is not monolithic and the overall level of risk really varies uh, substantially across different regions. So here on the right, we have a map produced by the U.S. Department of State, which assigns a risk level to all of Mexico's 32 states. Um, red signifies, you know, do not travel. Um, orange is we consider the need to travel. And yellow is exercise increased caution. And uh, you'll notice that there's no green here. Um, so I'm not going to go state by state, but I'd like to just give a kind of a general overview of some of the unique dynamics that we see in different regions. Uh, so to begin, in the northern border states, uh, we have mostly orange or we consider travel designations. And given their location along the U.S. border, we see fierce competition in these states between rival cartels vying to control these lucrative smuggling corridors that run northward into the U.S. So while you have narcotics moving north, um, you have guns and money flowing south. And as a product of these protracted turf wars, we see very high levels of violent crime, uh, though it's predominantly gang on gang. In cities such as uh, Ciudad Juarez, Tijuana, Reynosa, targeted killings and drug-related firefights usually occur multiple times each day. Uh, moving on, we see some similar dynamics at play in the states that make up the Baja Peninsula in the northwest and the Yucatan Peninsula in the southeast. Um, we see that all of these states are designated as yellow or increased caution. And these states are home to the country's biggest tourist destination. So uh, we're talking about Los Cabos in uh, Baja California Sur up in the Northwest and um, Cancun, Playa del Carmen down in um, the Southeast. And these states economies largely revolve around tourism. And we see a disproportionate concentration of security forces in such areas to really protect this critical pillar of income. Still, uh, the upscale nightlife, the constant influx of wealthy tourists uh, means that there's actually a high local demand for drugs. And uh, we often hear reports of small scale transactions taking place in the, in the restrooms of nightclubs and uh, bars and hotels and things like that. So the result is that there's still very high levels of gang on gang violent crime competition over control of these sales, but the tourist districts are somewhat insulated against it. Um, uh, the, the tourist districts are certainly, they're not, places like Cancun, they're certainly not immune to drug, to drug violence and uh, shootings and extortion attacks can take place in these areas, just that they're less common. And it's really more of a headline worthy event when we see something like that, especially if foreign nationals are harmed. Um, if we move on here to the central portion of the country, we can see a mix of uh, yellow and orange. And some of the biggest challenges in this region have uh, come about uh, really as a result of these drug trafficking cartels seeking to expand and diversify and move into new types of crime. Many of the country's major uh, fuel pipelines go through, run through the, the middle portion of the country, the central, these central states here. And um, 
While fuel theft used to resemble a cottage industry with small groups, locally based gangs kind of uh, installing these little pipeline taps and siphoning off relatively small quantities of fuel, uh, over the last several years, some of these larger cartels that had already amassed a substantial amount of resources and manpower through drug trafficking uh, really moved into the business. And we've seen the emergence of these new turf wars. Uh, the most violent conflict surrounding this right now is um, taking place in the central state of Guanajuato. Um, that's the state that registered the highest number of homicides in 2019, where the Jalisco New Generation Cartel is trying to displace the Santa Rosa de Lima Cartel. And um, also, as I'll discuss in more depth later on, it's also throughout this central portion of the country where you have Mexico's most dangerous highways and the highest incidence of banditry and cargo theft. Uh, finally, if we turn to the Southwest, we see a cluster of red level states or do not travel states, um, down here, Guerrero, Michoacan, Colima. And uh, much of this region is characterized by sparsely populated mountainous terrain. And, um, and many of these um, sparsely populated, many of these small kind of rural communities Police presence is virtually non-existent. So in the aftermath of major security incidents, it can take hours for state or federal level forces to respond. And this really creates a permissive environment for organized crime. And we consequently see um, many, many criminal organizations operating relatively openly throughout the region. Uh, so in response, some communities have opted to form militias or self-defense groups, as they often call themselves. Uh, some of these act with a tacit or active approval from authorities but some are completely outside of the law. Many of them uh, will man roadblocks and levy illegal tolls on motorists. Some will actually come to engage in drug trafficking and other crimes themselves. Um, but also here in the Southwest, historically, this is where most poppy cultivation has taken place in the country. Although this has declined in recent years uh, with a shift towards synthetic drugs such as fentanyl and methamphetamine. Um, and the shift to these synthetic drugs meant an increase in demand for the precursor chemicals that are needed to make them. Most of them are imported from China. They arrive in ports on Mexico's West Coast. And consequently, there's been a scramble among these rival drug trafficking cartels to control the ports. So um, they infiltrate these seaports and through a combination of bribery and threats, they corrupt dock workers, customs officers, and administ administrative personnel. And it's widely believed that uh, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel has effectively infiltrated the country's two busiest ports, which are both located in this region, um, Port of Manzanillo in Colima and the Port of Lázaro Cárdenas in Michoacán. So against this backdrop, let's now turn to the ways that organized crime can directly impact business operations in the country. Uh, we'll start with extortion. So this is a map produced by a Mexican NGO called Semáforo Delictivo, which tracks trends and statistics regarding a wide variety of crime. The dark uh, brick red colored states are those where the number of extortion complaints per 100,000 residents was double or more than the national average of 6.7. The lighter red signifies an extortion rate above the national average. The yellow states fall right around the national average and um, green states fall 25% or more below the national average. So the premise of extortion or protection rackets is really quite simple. Criminals will approach a business owner or an employee, and this can be in person, through a note, or you know, most commonly actually over the phone, and demand these protection payments. This is often locally referred to as um, cobro de piso or derecho de piso. Um, and the criminals threaten the victim with violence or vandalism should they refuse to pay. And uh, Mexican authorities report that over 8,500 complaints of, of extortion were filed across the country in 2019 which uh, marks an increase of roughly 29% over the previous year. So this actually makes extortion the fastest growing category of crime for last year. Um, what this means is likely that more criminal organizations are turning to extortion. Part of this is, um, again, in some cases, we're seeing these larger criminal organizations such as uh, Santa Rosa de Lima Cartel in uh, Guanajuato, that we're seeing them move into the crime, another type of diversifying, um, as we saw with fuel theft. One of the sharpest uh, reported increases in extortion for last year took place in Mexico City, uh, where they registered an 81% increase, um, which was largely the result of um, a gang called Unión Tepito, uh, which made this, this big push to uh, start extorting street vendors and also uh, public transportation companies that operate um, buses and minibuses. Um, and authorities have also found that even in some cases, independent criminals are calling business owners and threatening them, and they're, they're falsely claiming to be affiliated with some of these larger cartels and large groups that have a reputation for following through on their threats. Um, still, even with these numbers we have here, it's, it's widely believed that these figures really 
uh, substantially underrepresent the actual prevalence of the crime. Because generally, if uh, protection rackets are functioning as the extortionists intend them to, they aren't going to be reported in, in showing up in the government's figures. Here. So uh, many victims are, are actually unlikely to report threats uh, owing to, to fear of violent reprisal and, and or uh, just a lack of confidence in law enforcement. And if you take a look at this map, you'll notice that it doesn't really um, line up with the State Department map I showed in the previous slide. Some of the states that are designated as red by State Department show up in green here. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that extortion isn't a major problem in some of these high crime states. It could mean that it's, it's going unreported and that it's effectively become normalized in some of these areas. Um, and the reality is that corruption is really endemic among police and public officials throughout a lot of the country. And if, if law enforcement is on the payroll of these groups, then it's not likely that they're going to, to help rectify the situation. So the probability of extortion really rests upon the credibility of the extortionist threats. So criminal groups are often unhesitant to make good on them. Extortionist attacks can, they can take a wide range of forms and they often exhibit escalation. It might start off with um, threats, then turn into graffiti or the destruction of property, harassment. Um, and while, while this alone doesn't often catch headlines, sometimes it does. Uh, for instance, in September, last September, a group of extortionists targeted a uh, Ford auto dealership located down in the city of Celaya in the central state of Guanajuato. They sent, um, sent gunmen to the dealership after hours, and they raked the office and a number of parked automobiles with gunfire. And the owner of the dealership, a Mexican national, ultimately opted to just pack up and relocate to a different state. Um, if we go to the far end of the spectrum, such attacks can actually get a lot worse. Uh, perhaps the, the worst extortion attack of 2019 took place in August in um, Coatzacoalcos, Veracruz, where we had about 10 uh, members of the Jalisco New Generation Cartel storm a nightclub. They uh, blocked its emergency exits, and they indiscriminately opened fire on staff and patrons. They abducted the club's owner, and then they lit the building on fire. 27 people were killed, and 12 more were wounded. Sometimes we'll see extortions actually carry out just a, a spate of attacks against multiple businesses within a single city, you know, in a single night in order to, to garner publicity, spread fear, and really send that message. Historically, we've seen small businesses owned by Mexican nationals being the most commonly targeted, but even this is beginning to change. Um, over the last year, we saw some groups muscle their way into the avocado trade, targeting some large plantations down in the West and Southwest. Um, and in 2018, we even saw Coca-Cola Mexico shut down a distribution center in uh, Ciudad Altamirano, down in the southwestern state of Guerrero. A uh, spokesman for the company claimed that they had received multiple threats, some of their property had been damaged, one of their employees was even attacked, and uh, law enforcement was simply unable or unwilling to do anything about it. So this, the decision was made to just shut it down. Uh, so business owners are really left in a very difficult position. And while you want to evaluate these kinds of situations on a case-by-case -case basis, it's generally advisable to, to never actually comply with uh, the demands of extortion. Once you make that first payment, you're essentially hooked. Criminals then might begin to demand higher payments or more frequent payments. Um, sometimes victims might come to be targeted by multiple groups of extortionists. And what's worse is uh, you might have one gang threaten you for providing payments to a rival group of yours. Um, and like I said, many in many cases, local police officers are on the payroll of these gangs. So there's really not a good option. Um, many small business owners in Mexico have even claimed that the threat of extortion has deterred them from expanding as they don't want a target placed on them. So uh, beyond extortion, another major way that crime can harm business operations, uh, particularly supply chain security, is cargo theft. Here we have a table produced with figures put out by uh, Mexico's National Chamber of Automotive Cargo Transport, Canacar. And uh, final data for 2019 hasn't been released yet, so this just runs through 2018. But um, just earlier this week, actually, a Canacar representative stated that the preliminary figures suggest that uh, 2019 likely closed out with about a 16% increase over 2018. So the upward trend um, is most likely continuing. And if we look back at these numbers, what we can see is that uh, we really started to see this, this sharp increase in the prevalence of the crime start around 2015. Again, like fuel theft, it used to resemble this a cottage industry. You had small locally based gangs that were the ones primarily committing these, these robberies. Um, Around 2015, we saw the larger drug trafficking organizations with access to more manpower and established infrastructures really begin to move into the crime. Um, we also start, we started to see a growing level of sophistication in the tactics and the technology the criminals employ. And we also started to see an increase in the number of robberies that actually entailed violence. 
Um, so road freight in Mexico accounts for approximately 70% of all of Mexico's domestic cargo volume. Um, and the financial toll of the crime is really just staggering. Canacar estimated that 2018 losses from highway cargo theft amounted to the equivalent of about almost $5 billion, uh, marking an increase of 14% over the previous year and representing the equivalent of roughly 0.5% uh, of Mexico's entire GDP. Um, and moreover, this has caused insurance prices for road freight decline, uh, adding on additional operating costs, even though it's only estimated that uh, about one in three shipments in the country are actually insured. Um, and the most commonly stolen items, we're seeing food and beverages, construction materials hit a lot, but also um, pharmaceutical products, textiles, electronics, and automobile parts. Cargo thieves um, use a wide range of tactics and the crime can be opportunistic or targeted. One uh, recent example of an opportunistic incident occurred on January 11th this year in the Eastern state of Veracruz. Two truck drivers decided to stop at a restaurant along the highway to get a meal. And they were each driving car carrying trailers. And they were the types of trailers that left their cargo exposed. So it could be seen that they were hauling 16 Land Rovers between the two of them. Well, a group of criminals noticed this and confronted the drivers. They forced them to drive the trucks to a remote area and they made away with all 16 of the Land Rovers. Um, in some parts of the world, transporters of luxury vehicles like that have started to utilize closed trailers so that the cargo can't be seen from the outside so as not to draw that kind of unwanted attention. Um, other times, <coughs> excuse me, other times opportunistic cargo theft could simply entail the use of a roadblock on a you know, remote stretch of highway. It could be something as simple as using felled trees, rocks, or other piles of debris to block the road, and the criminals will simply lay in wait and rob the first vehicle to come along. Uh, alternatively, a, a more complex uh, version of this has become more common is the fake checkpoint, where criminals pose as law enforcement personnel, often in uh, stolen or counterfeit uniforms. And this can allow them to carry out fraudulent inspections of cargo. They can take a look at what's inside the truck before making the determination whether or not it actually warrants stealing. Um, but also we see target robberies. This could again be as simple as having a lookout along an overpass or an outcropping with a radio or a cell phone. Um, we can contact collaborators who might be waiting further down the highway once they see a high value truck moving along. Um, or it's also become increasingly common, members of the cartels will either bribe employees at distribution centers or have someone from, from the gang actually get a job at one of these locations and infiltrate it so they can have access to shipping schedules and manifests. So transporters are certainly well aware of this growing problem and uh, they try to take some countermeasures, but in some ways, this has started to give rise to a bit of an arms race dynamic. Um, some trucking companies started to outfit their tracker trailers with uh, GPS tra trackers so that they can be monitored in real time. Uh, but now, sometimes the thieves will, you know, they're aware of this, they'll steal the tracker and then they'll give it to someone who has a motorcycle or another vehicle, and that person will just simply keep driving along the highway. Um, you know, along along the path that the, that the truck was going to take. So this gives the impression to anyone monitoring it that all is normal, there's no apparent deviations. So this just gives the criminals more time to either unload the merchandise or make away with the truck. Um, companies have also tried to establish best practices such as having drivers maintain regular contact with dispatchers. But um, in recent years, criminals have started to use jamming devices, which are capable of blocking cell phone signals and radio transmissions. And while these jamming devices were finally outlawed last year, uh, they were relatively cheap and easily available for purchase online for years. So there's most likely still a lot of them in circulation. Uh, still, there are other countermeasures that can be taken. Um, truckers can travel in convoys. Um, they can install duress systems like panic buttons. Some companies have started investing in armored cabs or even armed escorts. Um, you can use remote engine kill switches to increase the likelihood of recovering stolen trucks. Um, in some cases, when you're moving highly expensive products, you can remove the logos from the trucks, again, just to uh, kind of avoid that unwanted uh, attention. You can have drivers uh, just whenever possible, avoid secondary highways and other high-risk stretches of road, you know, when possible. Uh, try and stick to those federal highways and toll roads where uh, police presence is usually better. Um, you can vary shipping schedules, try and avoid patterns. And um, Mexican authorities report that most truck robberies take place between midnight and 2 a.m. So while some drivers might prefer driving at night to avoid traffic, um, you know, avoiding these times could, could help improve their chances. Uh, but perhaps most importantly is maintaining tight internal security. 
and conducting thorough vetting of uh, employees at warehouses and distribution centers. Um, restrict access to shipping schedules, manifest, keep these on a need to know basis just to try and just to mitigate the, uh, the insider threat. Um, and finally, sometimes criminals will case or a warehouse will surveil it, um, a warehouse or distribution center just to try and uncover patterns. Um, so some companies have tasked security personnel with conducting counter surveillance, even if it's just uh, periodically you know, conducting patrols outside the perimeter of a, of a facility to just try and stay on the lookout for any suspicious activity. Um, and while highway cargo theft occurs widely across Mexico, it's the central portion of the country is really the leading hotspot. If take a look at the chart on the right here. We have um, the states where the most truck robberies were reported between January and October of last year. And you can see that uh, Estado de Mexico, which um, largely surrounds Mexico City, they just report far more robberies than uh, even the second highest state of Puebla. Um, Federal Highway uh, 150D, which um, runs from Mexico City through Estado de Mexico and Puebla into Veracruz, um, that experienced more robberies than any other single roadway with uh, 131 robberies on, on, the, on that highway uh, through this time frame alone. Um, but you also have a high number of robberies on many of the corridors leading into and out of Mexico City. And it's worth noting here that uh, it's, it's no coincidence that a lot of the states that make this top five list are home to Mexico's major centers of industry. So, um, for example, Monterrey is located in Nuevo León. It's huge in steel and glass, uh, a lot of manufacturing. In San Luis Potosí, you have uh, General Motors and BMW plants. In Puebla, you have um, Volkswagen and Audi. So if we move on to train robberies, there are some similar dynamics at hand. Um, again, we're seeing large criminal organizations move into the business. Um, that insider threat is certainly present. But in terms of the actual number of robberies and the financial impact, um, it's well below what we see in, in uh, highway cargo theft. Uh, Mexico's regulatory agency of railroad transport, the ARTF, estimates annual losses at roughly $40 million. Um, here we have a graph made with statistics that they've put out. And we can see another big spike, uh, this time starting in, in early 2017, but kind of leveling out, hovering around about uh, 1,000 incidents per quarter since 2018. Um, part of this is just the fact that robbing trains is often a lot harder than robbing trucks. And in terms of the tactics that criminals use, um, freight trains are most often targeted by criminals when they're traveling at low speeds. So, for instance, when they're going up a hill or passing along a section of track with a sharp turn or moving through urban areas or towns where they're required to, to, to uh, maintain lower speeds. Criminals will sometimes wreck barricades on the rail. Sometimes they'll sabotage the railroad itself to try and provoke a derailment. Um, sometimes criminals will board a train and they might force the conductor to stop at gunpoint or close the train's brake valve and bring it to a halt. In some cases, they might even detach a car and just leave it behind to be looted. Um, and in some cases, we've seen cases where when trains have stopped or derailed in, in towns or urban areas, members of the local population have even descended on, on, the, on the trains to, to engage in looting. As far as countermeasures go, uh, some rail companies have started to install perimeter fences along vulnerable segments of track. We've seen some expanded security camera coverage, sometimes uh, including drone surveillance, uh, enhanced patrols by security personnel. And in some locations, um, those segments of rail that require the trains to travel slowly are just being reconstructed or relocated to allow the trains to maintain higher speeds and reduce the likelihood of being boarded by bandits. Um, and then lastly, of course, just again, tightening those internal controls and vetting to mitigate the risk of insider collusion, um, similar to, to trucking companies. Here we have a nice map that was put out by uh, the ARTF depicting the locations of train robberies. This is for um, third quarter of 2019. These small white dots signify one to three robberies. The light purple or lavender color are four to 10 robberies and the larger magenta fuchsia color um, dots are 11 to 24 incidents. So as you can see, train robberies are quite diffuse uh, geographically. Um, at least throughout the first three quarters of 2019, the highest number uh, were reported in the central state of Tlaxcala, depicted in the uh, lay in there in the top right. But this was followed by the western state of Jalisco, the northwestern state of Sonora, the northeastern state of Coahuila, and the central state of Puebla. So it's, it's really all over the place. 
Um, as far as what's getting stolen, we see a lot of overlap with the cargo that's getting hit on trucks. ART, I've reported cereals, flowers, and other food stuffs are most commonly stolen um, type of cargo. But there's also been an uptick in the theft of car batteries and other auto parts that can fetch really high price on the black market, uh, along with construction materials and some other miscellaneous industrial products. So the last topic I wanna to hit here is uh, disruptive protest activity. Like much of Latin America, Mexico experiences a far higher frequency of protests than what we see in the United States. Um, in recent years, Mexican media outlets have reported that in Mexico City, Mexico City has averaged um, about 13 protests a day. So there's a broad range of political, social, and economic issues that drive these demonstrations. Um, they're sometimes tied to labor actions. Uh, and most of the time though, the impacts of these marches and sit-ins and street manifestations are highly localized. Um, one of the most common things we'll see is disruption um, to traffic within urban areas, um, occasionally vandalism or clashes with police, but still most are relatively short-lived and highly local. But some groups specifically attempt to disrupt commerce in order to try and force policymakers into making concessions. And the use of roadblocks is the most common tactic in this regard. We'll see protesters sometimes simply just amass uh, large piles of pallets or felled trees or stones or furniture, tires, and um, often set it on fire. Sometimes we'll uh, just see them form a human chain and just shut down a major highway. Sometimes these protesters will uh, seize control of toll booths. And similar idea with the railroads. Um, Although the rail, we, we more often see the theft of buses and other uh, motor vehicles, which are then parked on the tracks and sometimes set on fire in order to block trains. One of the worst offenders in this regard is a group called the CNTE, the National Coordinator of Education Workers, which is this uh, radical teachers union with a heavy presence in the South and the Southwest. Um, they often collaborate with uh, normalistas. These are um, college students that are studying to become teachers at schools in, in rural parts of Mexico. Um, and when they launch protests, they very frequently resort to vandalism, arson, and blocking railroads. In uh, February 2018, CNTE blocked railroads at a number of different locations throughout the southwestern state of Michoacan, including um, railroads that are linked to the port of Las Cardenas. So shipments of steel, iron, and other materials were blocked for several days. And we saw supply chains cut off to a number of automotive manufacturers, uh, including um, General Motors, Ford, Honda, and Kia. Um, and it was reported that the incident resulted in at least $21 million in lost revenue. Um, another similar episode took place in early 2019 when the CNT again blocked multiple railroads across Michoacan. Uh, but this time, intermittent blockages remained in place for about three weeks. Um, and a number of other sectors were impacted beyond the automotive industry. We saw shipments of livestock feed cut off for um, you know, people in the agro business, sand and other raw materials weren't reaching glass producers. And uh, in the end, it was reported that about over, over 350 freight train shipments were just blocked. Um, moving on, once in a while, we'll see similar protest actions like this affecting ports, um, but it's generally less common, but uh, it can of course be very disruptive to supply chains when it does occur. Last August, there were, was a group of about 150 fishermen that formed a blockade outside the port of Las Cardenas with about 40 of their own boats. So cargo ships were unable to unload at the port for several days. And um, it was estimated that over 6,000 cargo containers were delayed. Um, in this case, it was mostly fuel tankers that were impacted. But um, again, you also had shipments of raw materials being, being affected and uh, both imports and exports being obstructed. Um, so while it's not common to see protests grow to the nationwide level, uh, they can of course be incredibly disruptive when that does happen. There are some activist groups and labor unions in Mexico that really have a national presence with chapters across many different cities and states. And when they plan a large scale action like that, it's usually something that, uh, that's publicized well in advance. Um, that's something that our real-time team of analysts in the RIMC can pick up on often and send out an advisory in advance because Oftentimes it's, it's that forewarning that can really make the difference and allow companies some time to prepare and put contingencies into place to try and, and mitigate the impacts. Um, still, sometimes these broader coordinated protests aren't well publicized in advance or the potential scope of them can be difficult to assess. So in August of last year, um, there was an organization of farmers called the Authentic Front of the Field 
that launched just a widespread protest with very short notice. Um, they claimed they set out to wreck 300 roadblocks across the country um, while they were observing a 48 hour strike uh, that was being held in, uh, over a, a dispute with the government over fertilizer subsidies. Um, and while the number of, of highways that faced extended closures fell in the dozens, again, just proved to greatly disrupt cargo transportation, especially um, in around the, the Mexico City area. Um, so sometimes protests can be even more spontaneous than that, though. They might not even need any real coordination, like we saw in um, early 2017, just impromptu demonstrations occurred all over the country in response to a price hike in gasoline. And uh, that's where the Global Insights team really tries to get out ahead of these types of situations, make sure that uh, our customers are aware when something big might be brewing uh, through global flashpoints or, or the other types of reports that we produce. So in conclusion, I'll just do a quick recap. Um, first, it's important to keep in mind that the security situation in Mexico is not monolithic. Um, while organized crime really poses the preeminent challenge, the conflicts with and between the cartels exhibit different dynamics in different parts of the country. And um, the type of threats to operations and personnel really vary depending on where you are. Um, secondly, the numbers that we do have, as imperfect as they are, um, indicate that extortion is on the rise. And unfortunately, there's no clear cut solution as to how to deal with it. In some parts of the country, law enforcement might simply just be uh, you know, unable or unwilling to address it. And you know, while it's best to, to assess these risks on a case by case basis, it's really never advisable to comply with the demands of extortionists because once they have you, uh, they won't let you go. Thirdly, um, current trends suggest that cargo theft isn't going away anytime soon. Tractor trailer robberies especially remain on the rise and uh, any supply chains that rely on tractor trailers um, or freight trains could, could potentially be vulnerable, um, though the level of risk is certainly the highest in central Mexico. Um, and as I mentioned, there are a number of best practices and countermeasures that can be taken to mitigate these risks, um, especially you know, maintaining those tight security protocols at distribution centers to, to uh, reduce the likelihood of criminal infiltration. And lastly, um, the protesters in Mexico sometimes take actions to deliberately disrupt supply chains, namely those blockades, highways, railroads, sometimes ports. Um, and these, while these can last from a few hours, sometimes they can last for a few days, or in some particularly bad cases, they can linger on for multiple weeks. Um, advanced warning isn't always possible. Sometimes situations change. Sometimes groups might decide to escalate their tactics, or um, sometimes local media coverage just isn't there at first. But uh, when you can get for a warning, it can be crucial allowing for preparation and enacting those contingencies that uh, might mitigate disruptions. So I hope this was informative and um, I'll turn it back over to you now, Susanna, and uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Zach, that was excellent. Um, so at this point, I would encourage everyone to use the question uh, section at the bottom right of your screen. Um, going to go ahead and get started. We did have a couple come through at the very beginning. This one is from Sonia. Uh, what types of steps is the Mexican government taking to combat these crimes? Ah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, when um, President uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador first came to office at the end of 2018, he really focused on combating fuel theft, um, just boosting patrols. At first, he actually shut down some of the pipelines that were getting targeted the most. Um, while there were some initial gains, there's been a lot of crime displacement and we've seen these groups kind of shift to other pipelines. Um, one of the big changes he made was um, the creation of a new national guard, which is really intended to serve as um, more of a military police, kind of bring the, the training, the firepower and the integrity that the Mexican army has um, create a force that's that's capable of conducting policing and responding to gang violence. Um, another big initiative that's uh, it's, it's actually it's currently stalled in Congress right now, but um, there's there's talk of an effort to effectively militarize the country's seaports and place all of them under control of the Mexican Navy in an effort to uh, to fetter out corruption. Um, in regards to to cargo theft. Uh, Mexican authorities launched a new security initiative in mid-2019 called the Safe Road Plan that um, is really just focusing on trying to, to boost response times and um, you know cut, cut down on banditry along these high-risk highways. So part of that, um, they rolled out a free smartphone application called um, PF Carreteras or um, PF Mobile, 
um, PF being Policia Federal, Federal Police. Um, but what it does is it, it allows drivers um, to you know support uh, to submit like reports of banditry to authorities in real time. Um, and in December, um, the Mexican National Guard actually rolled out another program in Puebla. It's limited to Puebla just for now. Um, where uh, again, just trying to kind of bolster highway security by making uh, what they call strategic response groups along these high risk highways. Basically just creating new dispatch centers um, along highways so that uh, response times can be improved. Excellent, I great. That. Uh, another, oops, yeah, no, that, that certainly answered the questions as far as I'm concerned. Um, next one is from Sam. It's a couple questions, but along, along the same lines. Are there specific Mexican states or regions that are considered failed and under control of the cartels? Mexican states where businesses should be avoided altogether? Are there specific Mexican states or regions that are considered under, oh, sorry, and then this, that, I guess it was a duplicate question, so my apologies. Are there specific Mexican states or regions that are considered failed and under control of the cartels, especially states where business should be avoided altogether? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, there are, some, I'm calling it, I'm calling it a, like a failed state. Um, we, we're not, we don't quite see, um, even in the worst spots, we don't quite see the same level of parallel infrastructure and institutions that we might see, for example, um, you know, insurgents um, exercising in a place like, uh, you know, Somalia. Um, but there are areas that, um, you know, we don't, we don't see them, you know, engaging in, uh, well, there, there are states, I would say, the, uh, particularly in the Southwest there, Guerrero, that, that cluster of red states, where um, you could say there are parts of the country that that resemble um, in many ways a failed state just insofar as that there's just a lack of institutions and the Mexican government doesn't really maintain any effective presence there. Um, also in the Northeast, parts of um, the state of Tamaulipas are, you know, just uh, the, the level of uh, the cartel presence there is really um, staggering. Um, we'll see, you know, just large scale firefights occurring on a regular basis throughout Tamaulipas, often involving uh, grenades, even rocket propelled grenades sometimes, uh, machine guns. Um, so a good reference for this, I would say is, um, you know, we have the NC4 um, uh, country report from Mexico, but a good, a good, uh, which, which looks at that, but a good quick reference is the um, US State Department's travel advisory from Mexico actually, which kind of, um, again, that's where, where that map was with the different color coding I showed in the beginning. Um, they provide kind of a breakdown of um, risks by state. And um, that's just a good kind of overview, good quick reference, because even within states that might have the, um, the yellow or the orange designation, there, there are still areas within them um, that, that are best avoided, just given, given the, uh, the presence of, of criminal organizations. Excellent, great. Uh, another good question, this one's from Ken. Do you have data on workplace violence incidents in the plants themselves? You know, I don't have that kind of data. Um, I'm, it might be out there, I'm not sure. That's not a metric that I regularly check out. Violence, um, you know, as far as, uh, yeah, within the workplace itself. Um, a lot of the NGOs that track, you know, these crimes, they just kind of, uh, you know, focus the numbers like within within a particular category, like you know, assault, homicide, kidnapping, um, extortion reports. Um, but I don't have that. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I imagine it's out there, um, but I, I don't have that. Susanna, okay, we might be. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to jump in here real quick. Um, we might be able to get their um, one of the contact information for whoever asks that question and see if we can get back to them. Yeah. Um, we, we do follow uh, government release statistics, so we might be able to get that for them. Okay, excellent. That's great news. Uh, I'll let them know. Thank you. Uh, next, yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, next question is from David. How do you think it will impact the newly approved law against selling the GPS scammers? Would this have a real impact on the criminal activities? Um, I think in the long term it will. Um, just. To, to crack down on, um, you know, to crack down on them, because I've seen studies, um, there was one NGO that looked at, uh, I wanna say about 3000 reports um, of, of uh, cargo truck robberies 
throughout 2018. And they found that in, uh, I wanna say about 70% of the time, these jammers were actually being used. So um, I think it will in the long term have a, a positive impact. Um, but again, just because they were so readily available, you could buy some, some crude devices like this for about 30 US dollars um, you know, online, just because they were available for so long, um, just so easily available. There's gonna be a lot of them that are still in circulation. And also just um, the, the reality is that like, you know, the crime is still changing, it's still evolving. And these organizations have really demonstrated uh, the ability to sort of adapt and, you know, you know shift tactics, embrace new technologies. So um, unfortunately, I think that arms race is still gonna be there. I'd say in the long term, it, it will help, but it might, might take a while before we start to see that reflected in the numbers. Great. Uh, question from Elena. Is there any indication that the situation might start to improve? Um, well, unfortunately, I, I don't think there's really any good metric that really suggests that. Um, 2019 just closed out with almost uh, 35,000 homicides, um, setting a record high for the fifth year in a row. Um, so if there's anything positive, though, it's that the rate of... Um, the increase in violence has lessened. Uh, 2019's year-over-year -year increase in the murder rate, I want to say, was about 2.5%, which is a lot lower than the previous year, which I believe was 17%, and even higher in years before that. Um, so it's good we're starting to see it slow, at least. Um, and while it's definitely good, uh, we're seeing President Lopez Obrador, seeing his administration take some efforts to crack down on organized crime. There's still a lot of wrinkles to iron out. Um, so, for example, that that new National Guard I mentioned, um, some police officers have have claimed that the guardsmen aren't actually conducting many patrols, and in some cases they've claimed that these troops are actually spending a lot of time sitting in their barracks. Um, so, some of these these new initiatives just haven't really started to show results yet. Uh, although that's, that's not to say that they won't. Um, uh, President Lopez Obrador, he's, he's focused a lot on an approach that's been dubbed uh, abrazos no balazos or hugs not bullets and it aims to to address kind of the, the broader issues um, and circumstances that contribute to gang initiation so um, trying to you know fight poverty and the lack of job opportunities um, but really it just hasn't started to deliver any any measurable improvements yet um, and, and the big concern just remains the fact that these these cartels, these criminal organizations, with the money, the manpower, and this established infrastructure are still just um, they're really, really starting to branch out and expand. Excellent. Um, next question is from Ken. How do you protect traveling staff, and how do you protect executives and employees going to, work, to and from work? Okay, great question. Um, <clears throat> again, um, they, the NC4 Mexico country report is really intended to provide like a pretty a pretty comprehensive rundown of these risks and um, advice for travelers in the country. But um, uh, and it, I would say it's um, it, it's important to be familiar with the particular area that you're going to. Again, so just kind of going back to the notion that um, you know the, the, the situation isn't monolithic. Um, you want to look at uh, the types of risks that might be unique to the particular area you're operating in. So again, that um, U.S. State Department Travel Advisory for Mexico, like I said, is a good reference, um, good breakdown uh, with just some quick, you know, guidance, high-risk areas outlined for specific states. Um, I would definitely advise travelers against, you know, really, uh, really just heed those warnings and, and avoid travel to those red-level states if at all possible. Um, and just be aware that even, yeah, some of the orange and yellow-level states have, have high-risk areas. Um, so. Basic types of security precautions uh, you might even want to you know you want to take everywhere. Um, maintain a low profile. Uh, avoid wearing you know those expensive expensive watches or that flashy jewelry that might draw attention. Um, take toll roads whenever possible. Avoid those secondary highways as um, they're a lot more vulnerable to banditry. Um, always you know avoid inner city travel late at night whenever possible. Um, and and beyond the basics against just like theft and street crime. Um, uh, kidnapping is a concern in some areas, um, in states like Tamaulipas and uh, outside of the Guadalajara metropolitan area. Um, so in that regard, um, travelers, especially when they're spending an extended period of time in the country, are advised to vary their daily routines, 
and avoid predictable travel patterns and um, just, you know, refrain from discussing lodging arrangements or um, like personal itineraries in public. Um, you know, I advise people not to, to discuss those with newly met acquaintances or on social media either because um, criminals will look for that information there. Very good. Next question is from Fabio. What measures, tactics, and or technologies are being deployed by Mexican businesses to prevent these issues and impact to their business? Um, well, so to, to, I guess to, to go back to um, maybe the most uh, innovative tactics or the most innovative countermeasures I think have come in, in the realm of cargo theft, um, again, where you just kind of um, uh, real-time monitoring with GPS trackers, again, that's not, you know, foolproof. Um, that's a big one, I'm trying to think. Um, I, I think the, the biggest one, the most impactful uh, countermeasure here is really, like I mentioned, just focusing on that internal security because um, it's just important to understand that you're operating in 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 a um, you know in a uh, in an environment with with really endemic corruption. So maintaining those tight controls can be really helpful. Um, technology, actually, one one good um, success story um, was um, well, I, I don't know if you call it a success story, but um, about 2017, uh, we saw uh, gang on gang crime just really spike. Um, throughout um, Los Cabos in Baja California Sur. And there we saw sort of a collaborative effort uh, in response to it, uh, where the government, you know, really invested a lot of money and personnel into this. But one thing they did was expand uh, security camera net networks and um, put in place some, some ways to, to boost communication with, with hotels and with other people in the private sector to just kind of, um, you know, just make sure there's a direct channel there and uh, improve reporting and response times. Um, so through those kind of efforts, and also just, you know, the government helped with the, a big deployment of, um, of troops, but they were actually able to kind of uh, shift that, the push the, the per capita homicide rate back down there. Um, in terms of other technologies, um, you know, it's again, with, 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 with extortion, there's not really a ton of like new cutting edge technology that uh, I'm aware of that you can leverage to fight against that. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. Um, well, with protests, again, that's something that we really try to help out with a, a lot through uh, the RIMC, because I, again, like I mentioned, the, 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 it's the advanced warning can really make the huge difference there. Um, just staying abreast of what's going on. That's why, uh, you know, my colleagues, um, and our real-time team always trying to get those that advanced warning out because that can be uh, sometimes the best way to sort of prepare yourself and brace for the impact of, uh, of you know some really disruptive protest or labor action. Very good. So we have about just a couple more minutes for questions. So if you want to send them in, we have we'll be able to grab just a couple more. Um, this one is from Marie. Can you talk a bit more detail about the dynamic between the cartels, government agencies, and the police slash National Guard? Do you foresee targeting of these groups to increase in the near term? Um, yes. So, um, I, I, th there has, been, in terms of, okay, the dynamic between these two, um, there, there has been a big uptick in um, attacks direct you know cartels carrying out direct attacks against members of the security forces um a lot of this well i mean this has been going on for a long time but there's been was a noticeable shift that occurred um in october of 2019 um there was an incident in um the, the western state of sinaloa the capital city of culiacan where um you might have heard of this this is a lot of headlines even in the u.s um where uh, Mexican authorities set out to try and um, capture Ovidio Guzman, who was the son of uh, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the former head of the Sinaloa cartel. And uh, they apprehended him and uh, briefly, but then what happened is the cartel just descended in mass on the city. Um, you know, dozens of gunmen, technicals, uh, those are like, like pickup trucks with um, machine guns mounted on the back of them. Um, they started just stealing vehicles, setting them on fire, and eventually, uh, you know, they were issuing threats over open radio channels, um, demanding that that Ovidio Guzman be released. And 
President Lopez Obrador yielded to the demand and they let him go. Um, so that set a very, very dangerous precedent. And in the weeks and months that have followed, we've seen a sharp uptick in the types of these large scale confrontations. There've been a number, number of episodes where um, when you see cartel leaders that are at risk of imminent capture, we see just, um, you know, their, their, you know, cartel members uh, resort to these similar kind of tactics, engaging in widespread arson, um, you know, opening fire on some cases on police stations or just, you know, patrols of security forces. Um, just earlier this week, um, there was a, a similar situation that happened in, um, down in the southwestern state of Michoacan in Uruapan, where um, it was a member of the Los Viagras gang that was, um, you know, being targeted. I think he was, he was captured. Um, and then again, in response, just saw this widespread, um, you know, you, you know, use of roadblocks, stealing vehicles, setting them on fire. So unfortunately, just a lot of other cartels looked to that example in um, in in Culiacan there. And uh, the, the takeaway for them, unfortunately, was just um, that, you know, if we, if we bring enough force to bear, then we can effectively, you know, coerce policymakers into, into granting concessions. Very good. We have our last question here again from Sam. Um, and I don't know if we can speak to it, but I figured it's worth asking because I do think it's an interesting question. Can we anticipate that the cartel violence and their operations will expand to the U.S.? Um, you know, so far, this is a great question. Um, I don't, I don't see that happening. So far, um, we've seen cartels operate with just um, much differently within the United States, States itself. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a really different environment. Um, I don't want to say we're immune to corruption, we're certainly not, but um, it's just it's a different environment. We don't have that same level, the same extent of, of corruption. I think we have, um, in many regards, some stronger institutions there, and um, the cartels are just aware that they don't have the the um, the same level of operational freedom that they have within Mexico. Um, also. You know, they're not really incentivized to to change the situation. Like they don't want to. Um, you know, there's a reason we don't see you know like uh, decapitations or these you know really gruesome displays of cartel violence within the United States uh, very often. Because uh, if they were to do that, get a lot of publicity, they don't want to provoke a huge crackdown um, because that would ultimately be antithetical to their interests. Because if there is some you know were to be some extensive crackdown. Um, that would really harm their ability to to get their product to get the narcotics into the United States. Then that would be, you know, they'd be shooting themselves in the foot. They wouldn't be able to, um, you know, they would just be jeopardizing their own business. So uh, my, I would imagine that we'll continue to see this the worst violence, you know, stay largely concentrated uh, within Mexico. And I don't see it really spreading into the United States in that in the same same scale. That makes sense. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you as well to Zach and Jose. Your presentations and questions and answering were fabulous. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you everyone for your time.